you will find little joy in your command, but with luck, you will find the strength to do what needs to be done. Kill the boy, John Snow. Winter is almost upon us. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm continuing my Fixing Game of Thrones series. So far I've done two videos on it. The first was a look at Jaime and Varys, and the last one was about Danny. I'll link those down below. I want to make it clear up front too that this is picking up the characters from where they left off in Season 7. I know there's been some talk in the comments about how Dan and Dave messed things up previously, and of course, that's true. Most of these criticisms I agree with. I feel the first very serious signs of trouble were seen in season five with the farce they made of Dorne. But the idea of my series here is just to point out how easily they still could have provided an adequate conclusion to their own adaptation in season eight. All these other problems from Dorne to the Greyjoys, the death of Barristan Selmy, the butchering of Littlefinger, and well, you know, the list goes on and on. That's for another time. So with that in mind, let's dive in now to how Jon Snow's character could have had a much better conclusion in Season 8. What was the biggest problem with his portrayal? It was Jon's indifferent and nonsensical reaction to learning that he was a Targaryen. He has the blood of the dragon, and it's treated as if he just learned his astrological sign. It's one of the most glaringly incompetent things that Benioff and Weiss have ever done particularly since John's parentage was one of the questions George had asked them before signing over the production rights. So this reveal should not just be significant, but transformative and even cathartic for John. He grew up as a bastard, and although Ned Stark treated him well, and most of his siblings valued and loved him, he had no future in Winterfell. It's why he volunteered to join the Night's Watch. But now he can see that he was destined for great purpose. He was killed, but brought back to life became King of the North on his own merit, and now he's a Targaryen too. This is no small thing. He has the blood of the dragon, Dan and Dave, and you handled it with contemptuous incompetence. On House of the Dragon, one of the best scenes in season one was watching Aemon claim the oldest and largest dragon alive, Vagar. When Jon rides Rhaegal, it's like a scene out of a medieval romantic comedy. There's such disrespect for the lore of old Valyria and the bond between a rider and their dragon, Benioff and Weiss just toss it all away. But in a faithful interpretation of John at this point, the revelation of his parentage and how everything has come full circle in his life, this should instill even more resolve. While he was betrayed with a bit too much passivity and subservience in season seven, some of that could now be explained away as just his desire to do whatever it took to defeat the Night King. Now, though, he can look as much inward as outward to find a way to save the realm. I feel John's further emergence as someone who would lead Westeros out of the Long Night would have had another pivotal stepping stone during the Battle of Winterfell. And no, I'm not talking about the dark, disjointed, and unrealistic mess that we saw play out on television. Incidentally, that was the most disastrous episode of Game of Thrones that had aired up until that point. And we all know that it only got worse from there. But dissecting that absurdity of a battle is for another time. But when I mention a battle at Winterfell, what I'm talking about is what I believe should have been a defeat for the North. You don't have a seemingly unstoppable villain like the Night King destroyed in a single battle, particularly in such a simple-minded fashion. That would be like the Avengers defeating Thanos early on in an Infinity War. This defeat, though, would mark the emergence of Jon as a Targaryen. I talked about how ridiculous it was for Jon to go on his dragon-riding date with Danny. But what better way for him to fully emerge as a Targaryen and for those around him to realize this than on the back of Rhaegal, helping the survivors retreat from the scene of the battle. In the aftermath, Jon's stock would continue to rise. As I said in my video on Varys, I think the Master of Whisperers would sway to supporting Jon, but it would not have anything to do with the contrived madness of Danny that Dan and Dave concocted in some fugue state. Varys would simply see Jon as more suitable for the realm. He has his roots in Westeros as a Stark, a house seen as loyal, stable, and honorable, and yet he's a dragon rider now, too. Before he even learned of his parentage, Jon had risen to positions of power on his own merit, 
chosen by others to lead at both the Wall and Winterfell. So Varys will get to work in the shadows pushing Jon's cause while Danny's power seeps away. On the show, they had an idiotic suicide charge to decimate the Dothraki, but more realistically, it would be the harsh winter elements that would take their toll on them and the Unsullied, too. History is full of examples of those unaccustomed to colder climates succumbing to it. Sadly, Danny, who thought she was coming home on her return to Westeros, will never feel further from it, as the Northerners, Wildlings, and other houses in Westeros are more capable of handling the conditions, and they're also more willing to accept Jon as well. For me, I felt that the final battle against the Night King on the show should have been the central location from season one, King's Landing. Now, this intersects a bit with the ending for Cersei's character, but that will be its own separate video. Basically, you would have an exodus of people fleeing from other areas impacted by the Army of the Dead, and this large group, along with Jon and Danny's armies, would converge on King's Landing. Incidentally, in the first Battle of Winterfell, I wouldn't even have the Night King join it. Why would he? When his forces can weaken the opponent and add even more people to his army. And that would heighten the foreboding and the stakes for Jon and everyone else in the final battle. And of course, Jon is the one that needs to kill the Night King. But he wouldn't do it alone. We'd see Bran's powers utilized, perhaps warging into Viserion, and then Melisandre would contribute her knowledge and abilities as well. I wouldn't even have her appear until King's Landing, with her having known that it would be there that the final fight would occur. And of course, others, even Arya, would assist, but Jon needs to be the one to strike the killing blow with his sword. As I mentioned in my Daenerys video, I believe she would end up sacrificing herself here in this fight. It fits, too, with her arc, in that while pursuing the throne, at least outwardly, she's been diverted along so many other paths from Essos to Westeros, and the impact she's had on people is perhaps even greater than she would have had as a queen. And just as happened with him before, people would then turn to Jon for leadership in the aftermath of the invasion of the others. And he would be the one to direct the effort to rebuild. Of course, he wouldn't do that alone with people like Tyrion, Varys, Davos, and Sam at his side. This is the ending that his arc was leading to, the somewhat reluctant leader who takes on responsibility and sacrifices himself for the greater good. Now, for those that would counter that George revealed to Benioff and Weiss that Bran would be the last king, I'd say that the problem here is that Dan and Dave never earned that ending. They even left Bran out of season five, and towards the end, he was acting extremely creepy. You wouldn't want him to be alone with your children, let alone rule the realm. And while you could repair Bran's character a bit in season eight, he's still not someone the great houses of Westeros would then turn to to lead them. But if you still want to be faithful to George ending, well, there's something else you could still do at the end. You could have one of the final scenes be many years later, after Westeros is rebuilt, where Jon, seeing that his job has been completed, leaves King's Landing and the responsibilities finally behind him. They then begin to evolve away from a king or queen to the Seven Kingdoms having more autonomy. And then someone like Bran could oversee a council that provides a cohesiveness for the entire realm. That would be a softer, more appropriate landing for Bran having a leadership role. And there's something about Jon, the final Targaryen, and in Aegon, no less, in the final scene, arriving at Dragonstone, with the full history of the Targaryens coming full circle. Not only feels like a better fit for the adaptation that we were presented on the TV side, but for the Targaryen history as well, from one Aegon to another. I'll be continuing this series with the next one at some point down the road, probably being Cersei, but we'll see. If you enjoyed this one, make sure you hit the like button. And if you're interested in more Song of Ice and Fire and House of the Dragon, listen to Caraxes and subscribe. I want to thank everyone for watching, and I'll see you soon.